Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just catching my breath um, from this amazing day that we've had today. Um, so please forgive me if I fumble or stumble or I get things wrong. Um, I'm just so full of excitement um, of what we've kind of achieved today and of what's about to come. So a massive, massive hello and welcome to the Edinburgh TV Festival and a huge... <laughs> And welcome back to the city. Ignore all the dustbins, pretend they're not there, ignore all the rubbish, just welcome back to this beautiful city. Um, I hope that you are all going to make the most of the next four days to reconnect with people. I have had so many conversations and encounters with people that I haven't seen in the flesh for the last uh, couple of years, and they have been so full of joy and warmth, and they've been incredibly heart warm, and I want you all to hopefully feel exactly the same. It's so brilliant to be part of this industry, and it is a privilege to kind of work in this industry as well. So, Let's think about this um, as conversations with friends, but without the slow bits. How lucky <laughs> are we to work in such a creative environment? As they almost always say on Gogglebox, it's been a year of great telly. Um, we've met new friends like Julia, Annika. We've met the outlaws, Hunteds, Nathan and James, Pam and Tommy, and Suran Jones as a human torpedo. We've watched Ant and Deck and Panorama kick the ground from under a Prime Minister, and we've marvelled at Help, The Dropout, Sherwood, Big Zoo and his two BAFTAs, and The Puppet Master. We've said farewell to old friends, Eve and Villanelle, Saul Goodman, The Derry Girls, and The Shelbys. I asked myself just how much more amazing drama can come out of South Korea. Attorney Wu, I'm talking about you. How great has it been to watch Mo and AJ transform the way we start our weekends with the new Big Breakfast, with such an inclusive cast and crew. But my favourite moments of this year has been watching Ms Marvel and its Muslim teenage superhero, Kamala Khan. There must absolutely be a part for a big sister in series two. <laughs> I will absolutely make my own costumes for that. Um, I am so, so looking forward to House of the Dragon. I've not watched it yet, but I am fizzing with anticipation to watch this, um, along with Gladiators, and it seems like every other returning show from my youth. Um, TV's in an endless kind of creative cycle at the moment. And who knows, maybe next year we might even get a game show out of Squid Game. <laughs> so now I'd like to introduce our player number one, Afwa Hirsch, this year's advisory, Edinburgh's advisory chair. As an author, a filmmaker, journalist and barrister, Afwa brings a huge amount of experience and expertise and a different perspective even if she isn't appreciated by everyone in government. Um, and after some words from her, our brilliant McTaggart speaker, Emily Maitlis, lately of the BBC and now Global. She has an electrifying take on a challenge facing all broadcasters and journalists. Impartiality in the age of populism. Before that though, guys, a massive thank you to Campbell Glennie and Stuart <laughs> Clark. And then, and all of their amazing teams in front of screen, behind screen, who have made this happen this year. And finally, my last shout out to our guests from the festival's new entrance scheme, the network, the emerging yeah. leaders, wait, wait, your time is coming, um, the ones to watch, and tomorrow's academic experts on TV's PhD. And not just from this year, but from 2020 and 21. These were the years. These are the years that we couldn't all be together. So having us all in one room is um, remarkable. So there's 200 of you. I'm going to hand over now to Afwa. Thank you so much.
evening, everyone. I have experienced TV from so many perspectives, like most of you, all of you, I imagine, first as a viewer. And I don't think I can express enough for all of us how much TV has shaped my identity, my cultural experience, my emotional relationship with myself as a black British woman, how I feel about my culture, my Britishness, my values, my tastes, my perceptions of the world that we live in. Those influences have been nuanced, positive and negative. And over the years, I have found a voice with which to respond and critique to the huge and profound influence that this medium has had over me and millions of others. As my career evolved, I became a contributor, then a presenter, and now, as Fatima said, a writer, a producer, and someone with a platform and power myself. It is a huge responsibility and one I take so seriously. And I'm grateful for that responsibility and determined to use it wherever I can for good. For many years now, I have been developing a narrative of what I think our problems are as a society, but importantly here as an industry. We have no room whatsoever for complacency. There are so many challenges we are yet to deal with, some we're only just beginning to even evolve a language for. My decision to accept the opportunity to be advisory chair and help shape the creative content of the festival this year was really one of my efforts at having critiqued the problem so much, offering, I hope, part of the solution. And I do that as well with extreme gratitude to Fatima, who is an incredible chair of the Edinburgh Festival. I'd just like to give an extra round of applause to Fatima. Somebody who has hugely encouraged and supported and inspired me in my journey in TV, and also to the entire team at this festival who are mainly unseen to you all, but work incredibly hard over August when everyone else is on holiday. They do an incredible job, not least of extracting unpaid work from lots of very talented people in TV, because this is a charity. And as Fatima said, and as you all know, the work that this festival does to create new opportunities for a new generation is also equally important. So our speaker tonight is somebody who has stood out to me for most of this time for a number of reasons. First, as an example of excellence in her role as a journalist, presenter, interviewer, and a voice throughout some of the most turbulent and challenging times in our current affairs cycle ever. She is an example of a woman who has been unstoppable on a mission to hold those in power to account, the reason that so many of us became journalists in the first place, and also as a multi-talented and kind human being who I have had the pleasure to work with on occasion and whose programs, and importantly also whose book, have made a real difference in opening space for honest conversations and revealing what it is like to occupy the position she does. It's a special privilege to be here in person tonight. It's actually my first ever Edinburgh TV Festival in person. I've only been coming to the festival for the last two years, and those were all virtual events. The energy and the passion for this conversation here has been undeniable, and it's really wonderful to be part of it. And the message that I have received loud and clear from all the events that I've been to so far, all the breakout conversations, even chats in the loo, have been how desperate you all are for honesty, for truth, and for those who do have power in this industry to stand up to the principles that I know we all share. And even when that manifests as tough love and a demand that we need to do better. And it's in that spirit that I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the stage to give our McTaggart Lecture for 2022, Emily Maitlis. Thank you. I just 
I just want to take you back. It's November the 9th, 2016. A lucky few of us are crammed into a hotel room in Washington. It's doubling as our Newsnight office. And it's around 9 a.m. We've worked through the night, an election show, which ended a bit later than usual in Times Square, New York, followed by a mad dash headlong into the dawn rush hour of that traffic-clogged DC. I am unslept, bewildered, frizzy-haired, badly in need of a bath. <laughs> and Donald Trump has just won the presidential election. London is by now fully awake. They've got five hours on us. And from my editor, Ian Katz, comes an exhortation I will never forget. Do not normalize this moment, he says. And that's perhaps where it all began. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a huge honor to be here tonight. Thank you for bearing with the drop intro. You'll have to forgive me. I'm a pent-up broadcaster and I haven't been on air for five months. <laughs> so I said it's an honor, but it is also a responsibility. As Afba was saying, it's a responsibility to get it right. And what I'm hoping to share with you this evening is the result of thoughts that have honestly been accumulating in my brain for years, certainly pre-November 2016, accumulated conversations with colleagues, arguments with friends, a bit of running commentary along the Thames towpath, and the excellent work of so many peers and academics. And I have been incredibly lucky in my career to have, I guess, had that chance to hold power to account. Princes, yes, prime ministers, presidents, <laughs> policy makers. But here's the thing. It, it is, it's got and it is getting harder. And tonight I want to just explore that because my suspicion, or no, okay, be braver, my thesis is that the political actors have changed. Politics has changed. But we, as journalists, have not yet caught up. But back to that DC hotel room. Anyway, it's a close-up on the illegible scrawl, this dog-eared notebook. This is me grappling now with my news night introduction for that night. And my editor's words still ringing in my ears. Now, he's not doubting the result or the democratic mandate, but he's insistent that we shouldn't move on too quickly. We should stay, as it were, in the fuck me moment. <laughs> and so I start to spell out what I'm trying to say, and I'm sort of scrawling and thinking, and I'm getting my introduction together, and I say, to the names of Jefferson, Madison, Washington, Adams, we can now add Trump. <laughs> Taste it. Roll it around your tongue. America's president-elect is Donald J. Trump. But Washington is this extraordinary place. It is a well-oiled machine that uses power as its fuel. And within 12 hours of that shape-shifting election, it was doing what it did best. It was carrying on. The wheels of government start back up. Barack Obama invites Donald Trump to the White House. Michelle Obama reaches out to Melania Trump. And we watch the mechanics of that transfer of power, the 44th president welcoming in the 45th president, as if this slick political show could simply replace one protagonist with another. We did not yet understand that it wasn't replacing one man with another, but one set of rules with another. We didn't realize we would have to change too. And that's what I'm here to explore. So first up, I hope I won't disappoint when I say this is not actually a post BBC ex employee rant. I've had <laughs> seriously two decades of opportunity that could not be bettered. I owe my success and more importantly, my happiness to the friends, the soulmates, the work environment I had there and all the endless talking we did. But this is, in a sense, an exhalation, a deep, 
breath out. All the things that wisely could not be said then can be said more easily now. So I'm going to try and do that. And whilst this is a lecture, it's not meant to be a lecture. I mean, I must salute the incredible journalists who've been on this from the beginning, unafraid and undaunted. You know who you are. No, this is, this is more of a way of owning my mistakes by sharing them, hopefully speaking to a generation of newcomers to journalism who won't then make them. And I've called this lecture Boiling Frog, why we have to stop normalising the absurd. Because my contention is that despite Ian's laudable protestations all those years ago, we're becoming anaesthetised to the rising temperature in which facts get lost, constitutional norms trashed, claims frequently unchallenged. This surreal summer has been a prime example. A total disconnect between the dire warnings over energy and food bills that are massively hurting people in this country and the SW1 power vacuum circus. We followed Tory leaders on tour, assessing their views on the culture war, the price of their accessories, or a tax cut. We've heard not once, but twice from the front runner that a policy idea was misinterpreted by the media and that, my favorite, a question was asked in a left-wing way. We then saw that same candidate caught privately apologising to the presenter for attacking the media as if it had been an indelicate comment she'd made about his tie rather than a staple of our democracy. And we only know that conversation because it was caught on hot mic. That conversation should have been said out loud. This isn't normal, or rather, it shouldn't be. Things that for many decades were givens, the checks and balances on the executive, the role of the judiciary or the civil service or the electoral commission, a media free from interference or vilification now appear vulnerable. We're seeing politicians move in directions that are deeply and clearly deleterious to basic democratic government. So what has changed? Well, there's always been scope for abuse in our constitution, of course, but in recent times, so many previously settled questions around our democratic norms have been upended and at a staggering speed. Dr. Hannah White of the Institute of Government observes, this is not about introducing change per se, which we've always seen. It's about people in power who are prepared to test the very limits of the constitution to achieve their aims. You don't have to look far for examples. Things that once would have shocked us now seem commonplace. The ministerial code violated with impunity, a blatant disregard for the principles of the cabinet manual, the unlawful attempt to prorogue parliament for five weeks by an executive that wanted to remove parliamentary democracy from the decision-making process. The blink and you miss it moment, the governing party's Twitter account changed its name to Fact Check UK in the middle of an election campaign to cope party propaganda in a format that sounded objective. Or the admission by the then Northern Ireland Secretary that he'd be prepared to break international law, but only in a very specific and limited way. <laughs> like murder. I'm not sure the breaking of international law gets off the hook for being limited and specific. We can go on. Limits placed on judicial review, minister's failure to defend the role of the judiciary, efforts to increase political control over public appointments, the attempts made to change parliamentary conduct rules for cronies. You know all this. You can join in the chorus. On the other side of the world, the former Australian PM, Scott Morrison, was discovered to have awarded himself the powers of five additional ministerial authorities. This autocratic indulgence signed off by the Governor-General, kept secret from Cabinet colleagues, from his Parliament, and from the Australian people. Not so secretly, Donald Trump unilaterally declared himself the winner of an election he lost. <laughs> this is just the context. Dr White believes the key dynamic here has been about privileging alternative sources of authority, the will of the people in the referendum, Johnson's personal mandate to try and stay in power, the shutting out of ethics advisers or the Lord's Appointment Commission when taking decisions. David Allen Green, the law and policy blogger, points to a failure of two 
what he calls safety mechanisms. The first being self-restraint of the executive, the second being the gatekeepers of cabinet and the cabinet office who are meant to step in when all else fails. Well, the long-term effect of those trends, I'm going to leave to others. But what I want to look at today is where we come in, journalists, broadcasters, specifically the impact that populist rhetoric is having on the way we do our job. Social media creates an arena that is exceptionally favorable to the language of populism because it benefits simplistic emotional messages that suits the elevation of grievance. And ours is an industry that rewards speed, amplification, and the intimacy of the anonymous off-record briefing. Many studies have looked at the impact that the media has had on helping populists to power. But I now want to ask the opposite question. What effect does ruling populism have on how we work? One person who studied this intensively is the Gates Cambridge scholar Ayala Panievsky. She's looked at the way that populist rhetoric has been used to discredit and to disempower journalists. We got used to that enemies of the people vitriol at the height of the MAGA days. But then came more subtle ways, doxing of journalists, cyberbullying, the tweeting out of private journalistic inquiries to encourage a public pile-on. She notes that even the right of reply can and frequently is used as a way of them airing claims that are meant to put journalists in their place as they know that a fair and balanced media will feel compelled to cover them. But, and I think this is where it gets interesting, apart from these methods of incitement of the public, there's also, she says, the impact on journalists themselves. This is her. The way populist rhetoric is used to discredit journalists turns into a sophisticated form of soft censorship. And she uses a term that I hadn't come across before, strategic bias, to explain the way we may be inclined to respond to accusations made against us. Unlike other targets of populist criticism, journalists find themselves required to mediate. We have to mediate that criticism to the public, so we are then put in a particularly awkward position. And the outcome, she writes, is ironic, that journalists under attack end up practicing bias in order to signal their balance and impartiality. It is, she believes, a coping mechanism. We do it to ourselves. Now, populism, make no mistake, is not a traditional ism of ideology. It's not Marxism or Reaganism. It has no adherence to a set belief or policy. The political scientist Kasmuda explains it as the idea that society is separated into two groups at odds with one another, the pure people and the corrupt elite. The editor-in-chief of foreign policy, Moises Naim, goes a step further. He says, populism is best understood as a strategy for gaining and wielding power. Frequently, it's a method of campaigning, often in the guise of the underdog. And once in power, in government, it continues to campaign picking imaginary fights to assert its struggle, even though it is now demonstrably, undeniably, the top dog, not the underdog. So what follows here, just to be clear, is not a critique of left or right, conservatives versus rate labor, Democrat versus Republican. None of this has anything to do with policy. It's why populist parties can shapeshift between the right and left, attract voters of traditional parties or none. It's not an ideology. It is a means to achieve and retain power. And I speak from experience when I say that it took us too long to recognize it for what it was and to find the journalistic tools needed to deal with it. I remember to my shame interviewing the Trump acolyte Sebastian Gorka on Newsnight in the early days of the Trump victory. Gorka would use up most of the interview time by screaming abuse at the BBC. Now, he didn't have any problem with the BBC. He quite liked the BBC. 
and he was always happy to say yes to the interview. But he used our time on air, and that of many of my colleagues, as an effective conduit to sell a key populist message, that the mainstream media could be dismissed as fake. Now, once you understand how this works, it seems so obvious. You kick down belief in a trusted source of news. You make the audience doubt what they're seeing, and you step into the breach, a shameless play for power and dominance. But in those days, I didn't. And as a journalist, I was mortified. And I would spend half of our allotted interview time trying to defend our objectivity, and the rest bending over backwards to reconcile his strangled version of the truth just to prove his criticism of me wrong. In so doing, ironically, I lost the very objectivity I was seeking to defend. When I was writing this, I actually looked back at an interview I did with him in 2018 to see if Ayala Panievsky's words rang true. I was thinking, won't be me, I'll be fine. I was horrified. My opening question to him, I said this, Dr. Gorka, I know in our previous encounters we have spent a lot of time analysing whether Newsnight itself is fake news. So just for the sake of our viewers and moving the story on, why don't we agree to recognise that's how you view things? It is insane. We didn't spend a lot of time analysing. He levelled the accusation to get social media traction and I allowed it to become viable debate. Do you see where I'm going with this? Either way, Gorka won and the BBC lost. This was when Donald Trump was already finding his feet as president, but our mistakes started long before that. I'm gonna take you this time to early 2016. The UK is beginning to debate the big questions around Britain's potential exit from the EU. It's complicated stuff. We're trying to offer our viewers both sides of a fiendishly difficult debate, and that intention was right, but we still got it wrong. We fell into what we might call the Patrick Minford paradigm. In other words, it might take our producers five minutes to find 60 economists who feared Brexit and five hours to find a sole economic voice who espoused it. But by the time we went on air, we simply had one of each. We presented this unequal effort to our audience as if it was balance. It wasn't. I'd later learn that the ungainly name for this myopic style of journalism was both sidism, which talks to the way it reaches a, a superficial balance whilst obscuring a deeper truth. This stage, I'd never heard the term, or indeed the criticism. I just thought we were doing our job. One year after the Brexit vote, shortly after the 2017 election had left Prime Minister May without a majority and in a particularly precarious position, I remember interviewing the prominent Leave campaigner, also a former candidate for Prime Minister, Andrea Leadsom. The EU Council President had told the BBC of his concerns over Brexit relations. And when I asked Ms Leadsom what she could point to that wasn't, was going well in the negotiations, she told me, with some exasperation, it would be helpful if broadcasters were willing to be a bit patriotic. The country took a decision. Now look, you could argue that my patriotism at that moment was shown in an attempt to do the job well, interpret for our licence fee paying public the state of government negotiations. But I do think that's missing the point. It's certainly missing the strategy. Because the way populism works on us as journalists is to somehow seek to divide us from the public, to make us feel that we are not of the people, that those in power are the only ones that can understand normal folk and that we, the media, are somehow getting in the way of that relationship between the people and their government. Back to Panievsky, who writes, this failure is framed as the media's grand conspiracy against the populist as the representative of the people. I wonder if you remember Donald Trump's admission to uh, the CBS correspondent, Leslie Stahl, on the campaign trail. She would later tell an awards dinner of the moment that he admitted the real reason for his continually bashing the press. I'm quoting Ms. Stahl here. She said, he said, you know why I do it. I do it to discredit you all and demean you all 
So when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. The larger the gap, in other words, that populists can create between recognizable media sources and the people, the less impeded they will be by any scrutiny, any attempt to hold them accountable for the decisions they make in power. You think that's old news? Just last week, Liz Truss told the host of the GB News Hustings, it's not the BBC here, you actually get your facts right. It was an artful bit of flattery which she used to evade a challenging question. Now, in the earlier Leadsom example, her rebuke to my patriotism, which, if we're being generous, might have been completely unconscious, could be viewed as a way of stopping me being the conduit, the challenger between government negotiations and the public audience, and casting me in the role of the outsider, the traitor, someone who didn't quite care enough. When he was leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn could also be dismissive of what he would call, as Trump had done, the mainstream media. His supporters would argue, I think, it was not without good reason. Certainly, undeniably, the Murdoch, Rothermere owned papers made no secret of their contempt for the man who wanted to be the next Labour Prime Minister. Their attacks on Corbyn were relentless and vicious, but his distaste for a large proportion of the broadcast media, amplified by a small but dangerous group of hardened fans, would see the BBC's political editor have to attend the annual Labour Party conference accompanied by a bodyguard for her own safety. Laura Koonsberg's press conference questions and that of several of her colleagues were met with boos. It speaks volumes that the editor remained irreproachable against an atmosphere of such hostility. Our own Newsnight encounter of this kind was minor in comparison, but it is probably worth putting on record here. In March 2018, after the Salisbury poisoning of the Scripples, the then Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, told Parliament that he found the act appalling, but he angered MPs by refusing to directly condemn Moscow, Putin, over its alleged responsibility for the poisoning. It involved the military-grade nerve agent, Novichok, after all. So it was a story that we decided we'd put on Newsnight that night with a large screen, large plasma screen of the Kremlin to symbolize the Russia context and Jeremy Corbyn in the forefront as the subject of that piece. That night, Twitter was alight with Corbyn supporters alleging our graphics team had doctored the image to make Jeremy Corbyn appear more Russian. <laughs> the Canary website accused Newsnight of creating a blatant visual association between Vladimir Putin's red Russia and Corbyn's red labor. A squawk box blog stated that the hat in the Newsnight composite has clearly been enlarged upwards for effect and Corbyn's coat darkened so he looks more like a Russian Politburo member. <laughs> Newsnight's programme editor, Jess Brammer, tweeted out a replica of that same screen we'd used a month earlier, this time with the then Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson in the foreground. Curiously, it was Channel 4 who went to the effort of a full fact check on that. They found that the hat only appeared taller because of a perspective distortion that was caused by the curvature of the screen, Newsnight's background screen. In other words, our graphic designer had received a vicious social media pile-on by people attributing to the programme a malice or a bias that could easily be traced to the shape of a TV studio plasma. Honestly, at that time, we weren't sure whether to find the episode farcical or threatening, but we certainly felt very alone and rather caught in the headlights. But looking back now, in this context, I understand what Ms. Panievsky means when she talks about journalists' strategic bias, because by the end of that week, we had invited on a Corbyn supporter, commentator, to explain to us what we had done wrong. And she explains that the broadcaster's desire to be seen as neutral agents 
paradoxically enables populists to further spread the claim that we are not. We were offering a platform to the very people trying to tell the public to distrust our news. Sometimes we tie ourselves in knots over the both sides and balance I spoke of before. My editor, Dan Clark, reminded me of the time we were granted an interview with Robert De Niro from New York. It was the height of COVID and New York had been decimated by the disease. There were makeshift morgues and a ghostly city abandoned by anyone with the means to leave. It was a really sobering time, but equally an exciting one to have an interview with one of the world's best loved actors. And I just wanted to know what it felt like for this archetypal New Yorker to see the city and its people so bereft. As we begun the interview, however, it was clear that De Niro had other things on his mind than New York. He wanted to rage about President Trump's mishandling of the pandemic. He accused him of not caring how many died. It was, for context, three weeks after Trump had given the infamous bleach press conference, where he was seen to be suggesting the use of disinfectant to fight COVID inside the body. De Niro told me, I'm going to spare you my De Niro voice because I don't think you want that here. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> no, I... I <laughs> De Niro told me, it was scary because everyone is sort of nonplussed and stunned at what this guy Trump is doing. You've got a lunatic saying things that people are trying to dance around. It's appalling. But in my ear, Dan, editor Dan, is urging me, as is his editorial job, to put the other side. And I'm resisting it because, quite frankly, what is the other side? <laughs> Do I say, nonsense, bleach might work. We just won't know until we've tried. <laughs> what? I mean... Or do I pretend he didn't mention the disinfectant? Oh, no, I don't think we've heard that. No, it's on the tape. Or do I say, oh, you're only saying that because you're a liberal, lefty, lovey Democrat, which doesn't seem to capture the gravitas of this moment when he's talking about a horrendous death toll in America. So as an attempt at pushback, I begin, Trump's fan base would take issue with that. Well, they would, of course. That's why they're his fan base, right? <laughs> But De Niro then bats this away by saying, Trump doesn't care for these people. The people he pretends to care about are the people he has the most disdain for. Which I let hang in the air. Because, quite frankly, I've heard many within Trump's own party and Trump's own circle say the exact same thing to me. Anyway, the reason I'm recounting this is not for the exchange, but for what happens next. We finish the pre-recorded interview. Adam Kamsky is the output editor. He's a big film buff. And as we're heading up in the lift, I turn to Adam and I say, we can't possibly run this. It's too anti-Trump. And Adam looks at me to see if I'm joking. And I'm not. I'm terrified that by putting out the interview as it stands, we will be seen as biased. De Niro is a world-famous actor and a New Yorker. And he's chosen our program, Newsnight, as the place to land his thoughts quite carefully. So why do I feel unable to let him say it without trying to find an equally world-famous actor who that same night is miraculously going to tell us the opposite? <laughs> and wouldn't I be tumbling into both sidism, false equivalence, even if we had? It speaks again to how forcefully even these imagined populist accusations of bias work on the journalist's brain to the point where we censor our own interviews to avoid the backlash. The coda to this story is that the De Niro interview did go out, probably with more, but his fan base pushed back from me than was strictly necessary, and the sky didn't fall down. Adam, at least, was very happy. The news lines were picked up around the world. But it's curious now to look back on our reactions because of what happened two weeks later. The now infamous Dominic Cummings Newsnight introduction 
got way more attention than in truth it ever deserved. It was neither the best nor the worst opening we've ever done. I say we because the scripts were as always written, modified, rewritten, edited, signed off by a team. The original story, you'll remember, had been broken by Pippa Creera, her excellent colleagues at The Mirror, who then went on to report many more stories of rule breaking over the subsequent 12 months. We merely picked up the story the day after the Cummings Rose Garden press conference. And our intro stated bluntly and boldly that he'd broken the rules. And it asked why the government, Boris Johnson, was standing by him. The introduction set out, as is often the case, the rest of the show. We had Conservative MPs explaining the PM's loyalty. We had pollsters explaining the public horror on that issue. We had defenders, we had critics, and we had a detailed analysis of which rules had been broken and when. In other words, the introduction was a precy of what viewers could expect of the whole show. And on the night itself, the programme passed off with a few pleasant texts from BBC editors and, frankly, little else. It was only the next morning that the wheels fell off. A phone call of complaint was made from Downing Street to the BBC News management. This, for context, is not unusual. It wasn't unusual in the Blair days, far from it, in the Brown days, in the Cameron days. What I'm saying is, it is pretty normal for government spin doctors to vocalise their displeasure with journalists. What was not foreseen was the speed with which the BBC sought to pacify the complainant. Within hours, a very public apology was made. The programme was accused of a failure of impartiality. The recording disappeared from the iPlayer and there were paparazzi outside my front door. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing here trying to pretend our intro was the Gettysburg Address. When I hear it now, honestly, I think it was a bit long-winded, wordy, sounded a bit peaked. But I don't think, wow, what a shocking breach of impartiality because we called out the actions of one of the chief architects of the COVID laws. We show our impartiality when we report without fear or favour, when we're not scared to hold power to account, even when it feels uncomfortable to do so, when we understand that if we've covered rule breaking by a Scottish chief medical officer or an English government scientist, then journalistic rigour should be applied to those who make policy within number 10. The one person, ironically, who understood this was Dominic Cummings himself who texted me that very evening to offer his Roy support. So back to the speed of response. <laughs> Weird, right? <laughs> Why had the BBC immediately and publicly sought to confirm the government spokesman's opinion without any kind of due process? It makes no sense for an organisation that is admirably, famously rigorous about procedure unless it was perhaps sending a message of reassurance directly to the government itself. Put this in the context of the BBC board, where another active agent of the Conservative Party, a former Downing Street spin doctor and former advisor to BBC rival GB News now sits, acting as the arbiter of BBC impartiality. According to the Financial Times, he's attempted to block the appointment of journalists he considers damaging to government relations, provoking Labour's deputy leader, among others, to call it Tory cronyism at the heart of the BBC. The UK correspondent of the German public broadcaster, ARD, Annette Dittert, goes a step further. She writes, public service broadcasters must always act as the corrective should always hold governments accountable, must never end up becoming the megaphone. That's the whole point of publicly owned broadcasters in a liberal democracy. And Paniewski has a warning for what happens when we avoid rebuffing populist accusations. She believes that journalists become complicit in the debilitation of their own status and authority. Paradoxically, she writes, 
their attempts to protect their professional objective facade may contribute to the public's belief they are, in fact, biased. We're doing it to ourselves. We, journalists, management teams, organizations, are primed to back down, even apologize, to prove how journalistically fair we are being. And that can then be exploited by those crying, bias, if it suits those in power to shut us up or down, they can. Critically, it is lose-lose for the audience. And there's the rub. Because whatever our journalism does, it must earn the trust of our listeners, our audiences, our readers. Otherwise, we are mouthpieces. We are mere clients of those in authority, cosy with those in command, disconnected from the very people that we are trying to serve. <clears throat> a lot of the examples that I've used here have been from my own experience. They weren't meant to be my greatest hits, nor my walk of shame. It's just the stuff that I found easiest to revisit with questions of how we should be doing our job better. I apologize to anyone who came thinking this would be about the Prince Andrew interview. That will have to wait till next time, promise. <laughs> and to those of you wondering why this still feels stuck in the Brexit and the Trump days, I'll say this. We are. Those two seismic shifts have not been and gone. They've come and stayed. 18 months after an attempted coup on the Capitol, on the democratic functioning of America, the architect behind the lie that brought the rioters is considering another run for president with the backing of millions of Americans. Here in the UK, we spent early summer watching the havoc at Dover Customs meet with a wall of silence around Brexit. Those who promised to get Brexit done can't mention it because it clearly isn't. Their insistence on third nation status has meant passport checks and horrendous waiting times. Labour avoids talking about Brexit because it's decided, rightly or wrongly, to distance itself from Remainer tags. And large sections of both the BBC and government-supporting newspapers appear to go into an automatic crouch position whenever the Brexit issue looms large. Many broadcasters fear discussing the obvious economic cause of major change in this country in case they get labelled pessimistic anti-populist, or worse still, see above, unpatriotic. And yet every day that we sidestep these issues with glaring omissions feels like a conspiracy against the British people. We are pushing the public further away. Why should our viewers, our listeners, come to us to interpret and explain what's going on when they can see our own reluctance to do so? So that's why I believe we have some catching up to do. Journalism isn't a dry academic study or a polished set of rules. It is a connection we share with our audience when we're helping them to understand things better. The behavior I describe here, much of it my own, was not a solution. It was a coping strategy. So how do we move on from that? Where are the solutions? Well, firstly, I suspect it's about sunlight. We need to show our workings more. We need to be braver about explaining the pressures under which we come and our own responses to them. And in that spirit, I will admit, without getting too meta, that as I stand here, as I'm speaking to you, I'm conscious of an internal self-editing. I'm still thinking what the headlines of this speech will be. Will they make me look bad or dull or preachy or reckless? Will everyone fixate on one line about Corbyn or Cummings or Trump? Will it turn large parts of the press against me? And will that stop me from going further than I should if the goal ultimately is to explain to the public how we do our job? I'm telling you this now so you know. I think 
We also need to find a glossary, a shorthand, if you like. We, the frogs, have to give names to the populist playbook tricks that we encounter. The InfoWars host, Alex Jones, shortly to be $45 million poorer, is not a conspiracy theorist in the sense he believes the rot he peddles. That doesn't appear to be the case. He peddles it to make money from subscribers to whom he then sells dietary supplements. Let's not intellectualize and debate the merits of this as free speech any more than we would fake medicines. This is just a business model. When we hear Donald Trump or Zach Goldsmith or Nadine Doris or Marjorie Taylor Greene talking about a witch hunt or Boris Johnson going the way of deep state chat, our senses should be primed. This is often a precursor to the rejection of legitimate checks and balances. We should ask why they're so afraid of scrutiny. We should beware the parallel that is not remotely parallel. The FBI search on Trump's house at Mar-a-Lago this month was reimagined by Trump for his supporters as equivalent to Richard Nixon's burglary of the Watergate office building. It wasn't. It's a trope, see false equivalents. Just as we now understand when we hear the phrase fake news, we should think of Trump's own definition for it, a conscious attempt to discredit and demean. Let's not turn ourselves inside out wondering if it's true. So the more we recognize these tropes as old, slightly sad and malign friends, the better equipped we are to call them out. Next, perhaps the style of our reporting can change too. I'm excited to see how the podcast we're launching next week with Global and Persephonica, the news agents, will allow us room to move away from cellophane wrap formality to lift the curtain on why things happen, how we choose our stories and how we book our guests. We've got the news agents here on the front row, Dino, Lewis, Sopel, Soaps, Gabriel, and there's uh, others back home who are watching, but we're keen to bring you what we're going to do next. And I hope that instead of the cliched stagecraft of supporter X versus supporter Y, we might choose nuance as we did occasionally on AmeriCast. There a conversation sometimes would go like this. What do you think of politician A? That's us asking. And the member of the public would say, liar, charlatan, hypocrite. And we'd say, you voted for him last time. Would you again? And the member of the public would say, yes, probably. <laughs> Because actually, people are complicated. They're not cardboard cutouts. An exchange like that might tell us more about, say, Trump's appeal to the Latino gay Floridian businessman, or Johnson's appeal to the Cheshire mother and fitness instructor in a way that staunch advocates cannot. The News Agents podcast allows us the chance to build loyalty with people who like something with its edges on display. Daily News now accounts for 10% of all podcast downloads. Crucially, it's attracting newer and younger audiences. So it is imperative for both them and for us that we get this right. Fourthly, tweets. The professor of political communication, Cluster Fries, asks, would a news organization publish a corporate press release in full without offering context or asking questions? We do so with tweets. He believes we should hold social media messages to the same standard, even if they come from, say, a head of government. Tweets need the same level of scrutiny in terms of whether they should even be considered for publication. We are, at our most basic, the mediators between the actions of those in power and the public. So fifthly, finally, most excitingly, the challenge for us, I think, is how we live up to that responsibility in a way that is both fair and robust. Because either without the other is useless. So let me finish with an example that my colleague Lewis Goodall threw in the path of ideas as we mulled over the voyage of our poor boiling frog. Let's imagine, he said provocatively, the Supreme Court in America has overturned Brown versus the Board of Education, that 1954 landmark ruling that would forever end racial segregation in public schools. Let's imagine that's overturned. What would the media do then, he asked. 
So I'm asking that now. Would we just document it, settled fact? Will we call it out as racist? Would we offer up both sides, leave people to decide if they like it? Is it enough, in other words, to report things that might radically change the very fabric of our democracies and our societies as if they were merely a weather update, leaving no discernible impact on the lives of those we address? It is a big leap. And I'm not, by the way, suggesting anything of the sort is going to happen in America. But I ask the question here because it scares me. Because whilst we don't have to be campaigners, but nor should we be complacent, complicit onlookers. Our job is to make sense of what we're seeing and anticipate the next move. It's the moment, in other words, that frog should be leaping out of the boiling water and phoning all its friends to warn them. But by then, we're so far along the path of passivity, we're cooked. Thank you very much. Thank you.